project descriptions of each of our panelists. And then at the end, we have um, the rollout. Sorry, I got that page. Um, there's a one page fact sheet on Measure A1. There is um, our schedule for implementation of Measure A1, which there's a lot of public meetings coming up. If you're interested in different pots of funding, please do come back down here and participate with us. And then the last piece is a multi-page document that sort of talks, lists out some of the questions and the issues that we've been discussing with the community about the funding. So, to get started, I'd like to introduce our panelists. Um, thank you, first of all, thank you all for coming and participating in everyone uh, at EPHO's Affordable Housing Week. This is a kickoff meeting. I'd really like to say this is a great thing. Um, Affordable Housing Week is one of my favorite parts of the year because EPHO produces documents that make it really easy for us in affordable housing to talk about what affordable housing is. And so it's once a year to have that is really great. I'd like to introduce Lena Robinson. Do you want to come up and say a few words about Affordable Housing Week? Yeah, thank you, Michelle. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lena Robinson, as Michelle said. said. Um, my day job is I am a, I work, I'm the Director of Community Development for First Republic Bank. And uh, my night job, which means my board member job for EPHO, is I've been on the EPHO board for now two years. EPHO is a 33-year-old uh, affordable housing nonprofit, membership base, uh, that seeks to uh, preserve, protect um, affordable housing through education, advocacy, coalition building, and community organizing. We were very, um, worked together very collaboratively to get Measure A1 passed. Um, every year, as Michelle said, we celebrate Affordable Housing Week, um, really just to continue to call attention to the housing affordability crisis, um, but also to really lift up solutions like today's presentation, um, and also to celebrate, again, the, uh, the advancements and the achievements that we've made in expanding affordable housing opportunities. So I want to, again, join Michelle and thanking you for all being here today, um, and I hope that you'll get a lot out of our panel on um, So You Want to Be a Developer. Uh, my uh, colleague from EPHO is on his way, uh, but this, uh, event really kicks off um, the calendar of events that we have. Uh, you're welcome to take a calendar, share it with your uh, colleagues, friends, neighbors. Um, I think that as citizens of Alameda County, we should all really be do as much as we can to be informed about um, all of the amazing things that are going on around affordable housing. And this is the week that we take out time to have 22 events in 11 cities between Alameda and Contra Costa County. So please take a calendar. Today's really the first day, so you have a whole week to participate in other things. As I mentioned at the outset, EPHO is a membership-based organization, and we invite you to join our collaborative. Um, it's a very low membership fee, and you'll be able to really be a part of all of the thousands of other people around the two counties um, that have created a coalition to expand access to affordable housing. So, with that, um, there's also a guidebook that's coming, um, and when my colleague gets to her, I'll have that for you. But I'm happy to see you here, and we're looking forward to seeing many more, and I'm looking forward to hearing you all this morning. Thank you. Thank you very much. So before I introduce the panelists, I want to let you know I have staff in the room. So this is Jennifer Pierce, uh, Jim Bergdahl, and then Elizabeth Cook was out in the back. Wave, Elizabeth. These guys really helped to make this whole thing happen, so thanks to them. All right, so our panelists. Hey guys, how you doing today? <laughs> I have Andy Madero from Eden Housing, Heather Gould from Goldfarb and Lippman, this is Dan Soslick from Resources for Community Development, and this is Susan Friedman from Satellite Affordable Housing Associates. And I still want to call them off off, so it's a little bit hard. <laughs> because I've known them a long time. <laughs> All right, so these guys bring a wealth, and there's one more panelist coming. That's um, Josh from Josh Simon from Mabalti. He's not here yet. Hopefully he'll be sitting right over there, and he'll be here soon. Um, these guys bring a wealth of knowledge and experience in developing affordable housing. All of them have been doing this for a very long time, and our goal for this meeting is really to talk about what does it take to be a developer and what does it take to build affordable housing, as well as what does it take to be in partnership with smaller nonprofits so that they can access the Measure A one funds and actually accomplish the goals of the program, which is to help us build more housing everywhere that we can. So, 
I'm going to ask each of them to do a little bit more of an introduction of themselves and their organization. And let's start with Andy. Hey, oh, hold on. And then we're going to skip over Heather, and Heather will go last. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Andy Madero with Eden Housing. Uh, Eden is a, obviously a not for profit. Uh, we were started 49 years ago by actually a group of volunteers who were working on a fair housing campaign. Um, they're all based in the city of Hayward, where we are currently in still based. Um, they, they did this uh, fair housing campaign. They decided instead of just doing fair housing, they wanted to actually uh, build affordable housing. They started off by doing uh, seven sort of habitat style uh, self help houses in Hayward, and we've grown from then um, to doing um, uh, multi family first development like affordable housing uh, uh, across the state of California. So, our project northernmost is Healdsburg, uh, as far east as uh, West Sacramento and Lodi, and as far south as San Diego. Um, currently, in the portfolio, there are 90 units, um, ranging everything from uh, family, working family, uh, extremely low income families, seniors, uh, and special needs, veterans, all kinds, you know, basically the whole sort of panoply of types of affordable housing, um, new construction, and access to rehab. Um, I've been with Eden for, uh, actually well, for a short period of time, for three years. Um, I run all of the real estate development. Um, I actually grew up in Hayward um, and did not really aspire to come back and do formal housing in Hayward. Um, I'm actually not trained. Um, I started off by doing, by really representing um, indigenous clients and uh, found that that work was just, uh, you don't need to do this. Okay. okay. Uh, although I found the work was, um, um, you know, very important, I found it was very frustrating um, because uh, I was representing people when they were really at um, they're most needy and that I wanted to get upstream with the issues and I discovered affordable housing and have sort of worked back and forth between uh, the development side of affordable housing and the finance side of affordable housing <coughs> um, He has 14 projects in construction right now um, and uh, probably an equal number that's in pre development. Thank you very much. Dan? Listen. Oh, okay. Yay. It worked. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Dan Soslack. I'm the Executive Director of Resources for Community Development. We're also a nonprofit development corporation. We build affordable housing, operate it, and provide um, resident services to the folks who live in the housing. Um, RCD is an organization that was started in 1984 in Berkeley, and our office is still in Berkeley. Um, we've been there now that entire time. Uh, it was started by um, a group of community-based volunteers. They also, they, some of those folks are still around. One of them is Linda Mayo, who's a city council member. Um, there's uh, other folks who were on the board and founders are you know still around, and they talk about when they used to meet in. Uh, some, you know, probably extinct soda shop in uh, uh, the Elmwood district. And when they got together, they, what they wanted to do was to look at a, a way to provide housing that was um, basically controlled and hopefully owned by residents. Um, this was in, in the 80s when rent control in Berkeley was really kind of uh, the way that affordable housing seemed like it was gonna be provided. Um, and there was a lot of, uh, real radical politics in terms of how the city was run. It was run by the Berkeley Citizens Action, which I think at the time or was, was you know, the key kind of party in power politically, and, and they really uh, were, were bits of, you know, probably to the left even now. And so they, they had this notion of, hey, how could we provide this housing that residents would really own control um, and for several years, that's really what they did. They, they were able to hire an executive director. They were able to get some uh, local funding from the Community Development Block Grant Program. Um, for about four to five years, that's what they worked on. And they, they were able to do about three projects in Berkeley that were either um, mutual housing associations or limited equity co-ops. They're still there today. Uh, we know folks who, who've lived in them throughout that time. Um, in the late 80s, homelessness became um, 
kind of a pressing issue, and the folks on the board at that time said, hey, we need to make a shift. We need to do something about that. So they kind of shifted away from doing resident controlled housing. I think they also found how challenging it was to do some of those, those developments um, with federal or local affordable housing funding. Um, organizing those residents uh, was, was slow and, and tough. So um, they kind of shifted their, um, their work towards housing the homeless and um, also began looking at multifamily housing. They also started looking outside of Berkeley. Um, Berkeley is a great community. Um, got some amazing, amazing things that have been done there over the years, but it's not um, an easy place for an organization to kind of work exclusively. Um, and so the, the board at the time said, hey, we got to get out of Berkeley. We want to look at Alameda and Contra Costa County um, as a place we can work. So um, over the years, the organization has grown quite a bit. Um, we now not only work with um, supportive housing, housing for formerly homeless and people with special needs, but we also do quite a bit of multifamily, um, you know, housing for um, affordable housing for working families. Um, we have elderly housing. Um, we've built um, about 55 developments, uh, about 2,250 apartments. Um, look, working now in five counties in terms of finished projects, I think our farthest north and east, well, is in Fairfield, and we go down to Castro Valley, and probably the farthest west is in West Oakland. I had to try to do that. We couldn't, couldn't, <laughs> couldn't quite do the same geography, but it's pretty interesting to think about that. So, um, yeah, I mean, we've grown quite a bit in terms of uh, the work we do. Um, we've expanded and, and um, made sure that all of our developments have a resident services component. Um, we're also beginning to work um, beyond uh, just our own projects and one or two of the communities that we're in to try to have a wider um, impact in that community. Right now it's the Ashland community where we just finished a project um, not too far from here, um, an un unincorporated Alameda County. So. Um, yeah, the organization has grown. The expanse of the board has also changed. It, it was originally, you know, essentially Berkeley housing activists. Um, now there are, are people from a much wider geography, including Contra Costa. Um, there's attorneys, uh, developers. Um, our, a third of our board um, is uh, it's a Chodo board, a community housing development organization, which is a HUD designated board. That means a third of the board is either low income or represents low income communities um, or is uh, elected from a low an organization serving a low income community. So that's been um, something that's been part of us for probably 15 years too. I'm the executive director. I've been there for 24 years now. Um, so I've, I've seen uh, a lot of the changes and um, maybe I'll stop now and <laughs> talk about that later. Hi everybody and welcome to those of you who um, have just come in. What we're doing is talking a little bit about, there's three nonprofit developers up here on the dais. We're talking a little bit about our organizations and how they started and a little bit about ourselves. Um, so I'm the executive director of Satellite Affordable Housing Associates. We've been around for over 45 years. Um, personally, I've been working in nonprofit affordable housing for 25 years. I grew up with a passion for social justice and a love of buildings and the built environment. And I feel really lucky to work in a job where I get to bring those two interests together. Um, SAHA started as two different organizations, Satellite Housing, which had kind of a church affiliation, uh, working on sites near churches and building senior housing. Um, and Affordable Housing Associates, which started as kind of a uh, small entrepreneurial developer working on buying up little buildings in Berkeley and renovating them. Both of them grew, um, and then three years ago we merged them together. So Saha builds all kinds of affordable housing from acquisition rehab, which I'll show an example of, which we did in partnership with a uh, local nonprofit, um, to big new co construction buildings in downtown Oakland that are lean platinum and very fancy. We have a big range of projects we've worked on over the years. Um, our geography is kind of the Bay Area except San Francisco, because San Francisco has a bunch of really great local groups and, and they're all busy over there. 
Um, so I'll talk about the little project uh, that we did in partnership with East Bay Community Recovery Project. So I think it's a nice example of a partnership project. Um, like our CD in Eden, uh, we have a whole bunch of projects in the works, um, projects ever, uh, in every phase from uh, you know an empty parking lot to an existing building on the market for sale uh, to rehabbing some of our own buildings. And I'm really happy to talk to you guys about any questions you have. Um, it's super interesting work, um, but one that takes lots and lots of years to get anything actually off the ground. So we'll talk more about that later. So I have to say, when Susan said that um, you know, she starts with a social justice background and a love to build environment, I went, oh my god, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly me. <laughs> Our last panelist is Heather Gould. She's with Gold Farm and she's an attorney, and she actually represents us, the county, but she also represents a large um, swath of affordable housing developers and other local governments. And I'd like Heather to talk a little about Gold Farm Hub. Hi, um, my name is Heather Gold, as Michelle said. I work at Gold Farm and Littman. We are based in Oakland. We're a 27 attorney law firm. We also have attorneys in Los Angeles and San Diego. Um, I have been there since 2001. Um, like Andy, I went to the law school wanting to do social justice work and found this law firm that represents primarily, if not, well, we do represent some for profit housing developers as well, but mostly public agencies and nonprofit housing developers. My work has focused predominantly on affordable housing development, both on the lending side, representing public agencies, and um, representing nonprofits in the pre-development stage, development, and operations stage. Uh, I do a, a bunch of work, as is my firm, on fair housing issues, and there's a great resource out there called Between the Lines, which is a book that we wrote um, that has a lot of fair housing questions that if you're gonna be a developer, you wanna get a handle on. Um, before we go much further, I want to talk a little bit about what the county's role is in affordable housing because um, what we do is we act as a lender to affordable housing projects. And so the vast majority of the funding that we have gotten in the past has been either federal or state funding. Um, we go after grants, HUD, housing, uh, the Housing and Urban Development Organization, federal level. We bring them into the county. And then we look around in the county and we find projects that are the best projects to spend our money on. It's not a lot of money. It's usually, we have always in the past been sort of the gap funding. We're the last money in to get that project over the finish line and get it, get it started. And so in that sort of role, we've funded over 90 projects countywide. We've got projects in Livermore, Fremont, Albany, and everywhere in between. And um, we have over 2,500 units that have been built because of the funding and the work that the county has been doing over the last 25 years. I've been with the county for 18 years. I'm currently the assistant housing director. And um, my team that I introduced earlier, what they do is they work specifically with these folks and their project managers on projects. And we, we do what we call document the deal. So if I'm going to give money or if the county, not me, but if the county is going to give money to the affordable housing project, we want to ensure that the public purpose is actually um, enforced. So we have a loan document that basically outlines what the money is for and why we're giving money. And we have something called a regulatory agreement that gets recorded against the property and it runs with the land. So even if the property transfers to another nonprofit or something goes wrong in that whole process, um, the restrictions on the property are, are remain, and they remain for 59 years. So when we fund something, we expect it to be affordable for a very long time. And that's the role of local government in affordable housing. And that's why we have an attorney, Heather, who helps us to make sure that our rules, our requirements are enforced. We also then go out and we monitor the property. We look every year at who lives there to make sure that they meet our income requirements. And we also make sure that the properties are maintained well, they're not running down. And we look at the finances and we make sure that the property is actually able to cover its costs mm. so that at the end of the day, it's not you know, getting run into the ground or it becomes a blight or an eyesore on the community. So our, that's, that's the local government role in affordable housing. And with Measure A1, we suddenly have a lot of money, right? There's a ton of money, $580 million that we expect to roll out over the next you know, eight to 10 years. 
So our last panelist has not shown up, so we're going to move on to the next question. I was really hoping Josh would get here because I wanted him to introduce himself before we moved on, but maybe, oh, yes. Oh, I did want to interrupt Dallas, so I'll have questions. Well, we're going to get to a section where there'll, be, where there'll be time for questions and answers at the end, and I'm, I'm hoping that folks have a lot of questions for us. And we're going to want to, our goal is in the next section is to really talk a, little, a lot about how does a project get built and um, what are the key important components of it and how do you have partnerships with smaller, smaller um, agencies that want to get involved in, in the affordable housing development. All right, so the next question, you guys, um, specifically focusing on one of the projects that you guys have brought, if you guys could describe the project. Um, and then talk a little bit about some of the ups and downs and the timing of it and how um, how difficult it was or not so difficult. And you know, just tell us about your project. <laughs> Do they have packets? Maybe you should just go in the order of the packets. Okay? Yeah, that'd be great. And so everyone here has a packet, and in the packet are um, yes. So Susan, let's go. With Susan. So um, if you turn to the second page in your package, there's a project that uh, I'm going to spend a few minutes profiling. We each have just about eight minutes or ten minutes or so to talk about the projects. Um, but I think it's nice because each of us has very different examples of kinds of projects that our nonprofits have built. So this project here is called Project Pride, and it's a building that was on San Pablo. Um, it had been a residential hotel for years and years, and then it went into foreclosure. And we've been sitting around, community eyesore, um, actually a lot of um, squatting and drug dealing. And the, net, the organization right next door, uh, East Bay Community Recovery Project, which has been in Oakland for like 20 years, they started fighting um, when the crack epidemic swept in. Uh, they were formed and they supported women coming out of prison, mostly with children, um, in their recovery. And they had been looking for some housing that they could house women in. In fact, they had been temporarily renting the, the building that was that uh, burned down, the 2551 San Pablo that you read about recently. They had been renting that terrible building from that slumlord for years, and they wanted to get out of there and have a permanent place, safe place for the women uh, that they serve. So they reached out to us, Satellite Affordable Housing Associates, and said, gosh, can you help us find a solution uh, we've got to get these women out of this crummy building. Is there any way that foreclosed building right on the corner next to where we are, you can help us get and fix it up? So uh, we formed a, uh, a relationship where they hired us as their development um, partner. And we did what was called a turnkey development. So we worked with them. It took about, the project took about three and a half years. Um, but we used our expertise to help secure the financing. Um, it was about a $4 million project to buy the property, fully renovate it, and then hand it over to them because they have really good experience providing services and property management. Um, but the tricky part about housing, affordable housing, first you have to find the site, right? This happened to be one of the easier challenges because the site was right there. Then you have to negotiate how are you going to get that site. So this was interesting because it was foreclosed, so we negotiated with a bank. Uh, and you have to figure out what you can do or build on that site, and you have to get all the money together. Um, so that's kind of, in any project, you have to have the real estate, the money, um, and then I would say kind of the political will and support, you need to be able to make sure um, that the project's going to be welcome in the community. And you also have to have a need. Um, in this case, there was a really strong need for this housing. So over about three years, we worked with East Bay Community Recovery Project, we negotiated for them to get the site. We actually secured the ARA money, that's the, um, the American, the, the, the stimulus money, if you guys recall, during 2008, 2009, there was some federal money. And we um, combined that with some state money, some local money. I have to say, any project is gonna have like eight sources of financing. So even though the county has some good money, it's never enough to build a project just any one source. So you need to find money from city, county, state, and then this low-income housing tax credit program, which we can talk about later or do a whole other session on. Um, anyway, but the partnership really involved us picking an architect, 
picking a contractor, um, figuring out what our scope of work was, finding all the money, uh, getting a permit, that's always tricky, uh, to be able to build what you want in the city that you're doing it in. Um, carefully overseeing the construction, dealing with all the hiccups along the way, and then creating the plan for how is this project gonna be sustainable in the long term. So how much are people gonna pay in rent? How much is it gonna cost to run the building, keep the bill, you know, keep the lights on, pay the insurance, pay the manager? Um, and then ultimately the goal is um, for actual people to benefit um, from the affordable housing. So I would say overall this was not as long as a project as some are. I mean, oftentimes it takes six or seven years from the time you lay eyes on an empty building or a vacant site to when people can actually move in. Um, and it takes experience both in navigating through the architecture, design, entitlement, and construction process, so those are all technical things, um, and then experience securing all the different sources of money. Um, so I can ask, answer questions in question and answer, but I think that's about my five or six minutes to profile this particular project. I thought it was a good example because um, this is a really grassroots project. It's a, with an organization that had been working in the community, that knew the population, that knew the neighbors, that knew the real estate, the local real estate market, um, and we were able to partner to bring our experience in uh, to help them accomplish what their goals were. Next one is Dan, right? All right. So um, one I want to talk about is the uh, Margaret Breland Apartments. It's a 28-unit uh, building for seniors that was opened in 2005. So it's a new construction building. Um, I, I should say before I get going too long, too much longer, that I want to give a shout out to Ebony Smith, who's in the crowd, who's an RCD staff person, who was the services coordinator for the residents at uh, Breland for a few years. Not, um, not working there now, I don't think. Yeah, but uh, so this is an interesting project, and I, and I really have to talk about it um, kind of in the context of time and time that's passed, um, more than in the development process. Um, it was a partnership project. Um, we developed it with uh, a nonprofit called Jubilee Restoration Inc., which um, was a community development corporation that was formed um, by a West Berkeley African American church, um, missionary church. Um, and they were active, um, very active in the 90s and early 2000s in Berkeley. They did some great stuff um, housing homeless youth. Um, they really were trying to build um, a community organization that would serve folks in the neighborhood. It was a pretty impressive group. It was really based um, uh, out of the church, the pastor, his family, folks who worked there. Um, they were doing stuff, and we um, kind of connected with them. Um, Berkeley's a small town. At the time, there were not a lot of, uh, and there really still aren't a lot of people trying to do affordable housing in Berkeley, and uh, I'm having a hard time remembering exactly what the initial connection on the project was, but I think it was that they had located a, a good infill site on San Pablo Avenue near Dwight, and we, we got to talking, and we said, hey, let's go in, and do this together. We had much more capacity at the time uh, doing affordable new construction development. This was going to be a significant project that was going to need a lot of government financing. Um, they had the site. So we kind of structured a, an arrangement to develop the site together, and we uh, made uh, an agreement on how, the, how it would be governed, um, how we would work together um, as a development team who would take different responsibilities, um, how we would split the quote, you know, developer fee, which is, you know, the, the one piece of money that kind of comes to a nonprofit through this process when you're um, developing affordable housing. When you're successful, you get a, a fee for your work, which really essentially pays for all of your time and risk for the, throughout the years. Um, so we, we, we structured a deal and we went in and did this. And this was probably 1999, as I recall. Um, we got funding from the city of Berkeley. The city allowed us to buy the site, which was great. That's something that's some, much more challenging now because cities 
tend to not be able to do that or not want to do that because they take risk, they took the risk, and at that point, at this point, that's something we developers do more of. But we, we bought the site and we were able to get funding through the HUD um, Section 202 program. Another interesting thing, that's a program that uh, paid for the development of senior housing and developed fantastic housing. And it uh, also came with a program that would uh, allow the residents of that housing to pay a third of their income as rent. Um, well, the Section 202 capital program that, that we used to build the housing no longer exists. Um, it was cut sometime probably about five, six years ago, I think, if I'm correct. Uh, happily, the, the program that helps pay the residents' rent is still around. So now, you know, again, in hindsight, we built this project with a program that no longer is around, unfortunately. Um, we, we were able to finish the building. Uh, we finished it in uh, 2005. It occupied very quickly. Uh, I think it's a fantastic building. Uh, if you go by there on San Pablo, it's a gorgeous sort of four-story, very narrow structure. Uh, it's, um, you know, won architectural awards. I mean, it's really a cool building. Uh, and I think the units are great. Most of them have views out over the neighborhood. You can see the hills. You can see the bay. We've had a, 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 a robust and, and good resident services program there for the, the entirety of the history of the project. Uh, it's a great project. Um, uh, in hindsight, uh, again, looking back on it, it had some, some things that happened that were more challenging. Um, one was when we started building the project, we realized that um, we were not going to have enough money to build the project without giving some of our developer feedback to that project. Um, that, that has actually not happened to our organization since that time, and I don't remember it happening before it, but it was a point where we had to say, hey, some of the money that we expected to get and share with our partner is going to have to go into this project to finish it. Um, so that's something that you have to know when you're developing affordable housing. You can get all the financing together, get the site approved, et cetera, um, but, you know, at the end of the day, you still have to go out and get a bid and you have to build the housing and the bid has to be good and the design has to be good. Um, again, in, in hindsight, another challenge we've had there is that the building is very vertical and it has some amazing decks that are walkways between the units. The wonderful verticality, great design, however, you know, exposed decks are uh, vulnerable to water intrusion. And so over the history of the project, we've had to um, do a lot of work to go back and fix, you know, uh, parts of the building that frankly weren't, as, weren't built as well as they should have been. Um, not a fun thing to deal with. You gotta go back to the architect and the contractor and talk about how you're gonna pay for that and what you're gonna do. And um, so that's something that's also a part of this process, and uh, it kind of speaks to sticking around a long time and having to not only build these projects, but own them and manage them. You know, the last thing I want to say, which is, uh, I think, kind of sad, yeah, kind of, uh, kind of sad and, and uh, weird. <laughs> it's <laughs> automatic. I shouldn't get too close to it. It's a, it's a technology that I can't, can't figure out. Anyway. Um, one of the things that has also happened is that our partner has gone through a lot of changes and, and some ones that weren't so good. Um, basically, over time, you know, they ran into some challenges with some of their other buildings, and they had health issues. The, the pastor of the church had health issues, um, and the, the organization really is, is not active anymore. So it, it uh, you know, it's something that. Um, can happen, and it's uh, you know it's unfortunate, but um, you know when you build these buildings, um, you 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 know they're going to be there for a long time. And that sort of again goes to Michelle's comment that they're 55 years minimum. So um, the people who give you the money have a lot of rules that you have to follow, and um, and that's and, and that's what we uh, what we do. So, Great. Right. Thank you very much, Dan. Okay, Andy, I think we're going to skip over Josh's. There's uh, there's one one in here and Josh is here, so we'll have to skip over that one and go to Andy's, which is the fourth page in. 
So this project is called uh, Miraflores. Um, I, I selected it to present today because today we're actually having a groundbreaking. So we started construction on this project about um, two, three weeks ago, maybe a little longer. Um, we started working on this project 15 years ago. Um, yeah, you cannot have a whole lot of projects that you work on 15 years, wow. but um, I think all of us who are up here all have it. Um, so this is uh, in the city of Richmond, um, and uh, as uh, I think um, uh, Susan and Dan uh, had demonstrated, we all we all work with local partners. Um, not all the time. All of us have done um, deals on our own, um, but also oftentimes um, there are occasions, many occasions, when we work with uh, local entities. You know, in this case. Um, uh, we worked with uh, an organization called CHDC, Community Housing Development Corporation. They are a, um, a CDC, a community development corporation that focuses on the city of Richmond and um, the area of, of North Richmond. And, and they really are uh, you know, a, a long-standing organization that represents the grassroots of that community. Um, it is a predominantly African American um, and other minority community. Um, they have been doing home ownership, they've been doing um, the services, they have been giving voice to that community uh, for really for decades. We, we have not. You know, we are, we are a developer, we are a property manager, um, we provide the community services, but we're, we are not an advocacy organization for a locality. So they really provided that voice. Um, so we, uh, um, this is really our second or third project that we have partnered with them in the city of Richmond. And, and the importance of having that local partnership, I think, um, it, you know, they, they can uh, provide insight into the, the needs of that community. Um, they can um, provide uh, a level of trust that you need to be able to develop not only to develop, but also, um, I would say, to, to operate for the long term. Because you, you know, we're working in somebody else's community, we're working in somebody else's backyard. I, I'm not there every day, um, but they are. The, the, the last uh, uh, <clears throat> importance, really, of, of that local partnership is also, um, quite frankly, the politics. Um, you know, a, a, any of you who um, have any uh, you know, aspiration of doing development, the reality is that there's a lot of politics that are involved. And whether it is uh, involved in getting uh, entitlements, so the right to build a favorite site, the design of that site, there are always many uh, political issues that are important um, that you need to address. And that, you know, they're, they're not, I don't view the politics as, as an impediment. Um, you know, I view it as really, you know, that's the process by which we make sure that at the end of the day, we have uh, a project, a program, and a building that really serves everyone, the people in the building and the people in the neighborhood as well. Um, the, I'm, I'm not getting into a lot of specifics about this particular deal, The you know, the, the write-up is there for you, um, even this project had. Uh, seven different sources, eight different sources of funding, <coughs> money going into it. Um, you know, one of the big issues with this project, that the reason why it took so long, um, in part relate to uh, the market. So it was uh, part of a larger redevelopment um, of a site that included uh, market rate homes, which are also going to be built there, which we're not doing, and other developers doing. Um, but it's also because the site was dirty. Um, there was a nursery, um, and a historic nursery, so we were actually preserving uh, some structures on the site. And um, the site had environmental contaminants as a result of its prior use. Um, and so cleaning that stuff up is a very uh, expensive, uh, it's a very risky endeavor, and it's a very, uh, it's an endeavor that is heavily regulated. Um, there's, there's, there are few sites that we now all work on that don't have some aspect of environmental contaminant. 
Um, we do, none of us really do any what we call greenfield development, so we're not really, very few of us have gone out and found you know, land that's never been used for anything before. A lot of it is, uh, uh, a lot of it has previously been used, and sometimes that previous use um, leaves stuff behind that is not really uh, um, fit for human habitation, so we can't have it in the ground around you guys or, or any of us where we live. Um, finally, very quickly, um, and I think we all sort of alluded to it, uh, you know, we, we all plan to operate these properties um, for the long term. There are other developers who um, will sell their properties. Um, typically, they're not us, they're typically the for profits. Um, but all, you know, all of us here, you know, are really uh, plan to own our properties until you know for the duration, how long or long that duration uh, will be. And so that really requires a level of trust between um, the owner, developer, the partner, um, and the locality. The the you know, and we all sort of talk about that. You, we have to, um, and that trust gets developed over time. You know, we we. When we work with partners, we really document how we're going to work together. We figure out how it is that all of us best communicate. Sometimes, you know, folks are very, uh, you know, work well on email. Sometimes organizations um, really work better uh, in face-to-face -face meetings. Oftentimes, you know, uh, we want to really work on a well understood agenda so that we're not just sort of going into it see the pants but everybody sort of has their issues out and um you know what and that when we go into these relationships we do so with really a upfront agreement about you know open communication that everybody's going to sort of put their stuff out there so that we can um, get through these issues because they really are long-term uh, relationships that have to last a long period of time and the communication um, is really is really very key. Great, thank you so much. So that brings us back to Heather, and Andy started talking about how you document a partnership, and I'm going to ask Heather to talk a little bit about what is in a partnership agreement between a smaller organization and a larger larger organization. One of the key things is is if you want to access all of the funding that's out there. And, and the vast majority of our projects are built with what we call the Low Income Housing Tax Credit. It's run by the state of California. The federal government mm -hmm. takes a, a, an allocation of money and they, they give it down to all of the states. And then each state has an allocation of tax credits. And then that state makes decisions about what the best projects are that they want to spend their money on. And it is really the vast, largest source of funding in almost every single affordable housing project. So one of the things that the state does is it puts out what its minimum requirements are for developers. And so if you're a small organization that hasn't done this before, you're not going to be able to access those tax credits. You have to get into partnership with a larger organization that's done this over and over again. And so one of the reasons why we're talking here today is that we can really talk through how to create partnerships between small organizations and larger organizations. There are a lot of faith-based communities or community-based organizations that have access to land right now. And we want to, in our very built-out Alameda County, there's not a lot of land, we want to be able to make sure that every housing opportunity that could become affordable housing has an opportunity to do that. And so one of the best ways to do that is to create these partnerships. So the affordable housing, uh, low-income housing tax credit is uh, again, it's, you know, in every deal it represents a minimum of 40%. Yes, sometimes it goes higher than that, but, but that's, that's a big chunk of money. So, Heather, who works both for local governments and represents the county, but also she works for other nonprofits, I'm going to ask her to talk a little bit about what's in a partnership agreement between, two small or, uh, to, between a small organization and a larger organization and how those organizations work together and they, they document the partnership. We, um, and, and I, like Michelle said, I, I've come at this from a variety of perspectives, right? Sometimes I'll look at it from the lender's perspective to understand what the relationship between a, a, a smaller developer and an experienced developer partner is. 
and other times I'll come in at the very beginning when the two parties are starting to talk and try to progress the relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's a microphone, everybody. It's like about two weeks old. I haven't done this. <laughs> Sometimes I'll come in. There we go. Sometimes I'll come in at the beginning when the two parties are working out the relationships, and other times the relationship will have already been at least outlined through a memorandum of understanding or something like that. Um, I think I, I do just want to take a back, take a step back and emphasize what, what Michelle said, which is that when you're starting development, at least in, within this industry, most of the funders and most of the funders will require a, a certain level of experience, and so they'll all, they'll want to see a separate development organization that has, um, you know, you'll have a parent sponsor organization, and you'll have a separate development entity that might not have any assets but it's set up for a particular project. Um, you will, you know, it, it will benefit you for property tax purposes if you have a 501c3 status. So if you're forming a development entity, you'll also want to apply for a tax exemption if you can. Um, and that process would, would require an application both at the state and at the federal level. Um, and then once you have that entity set up, you can look either to apply for yourself for financing if you have the experience, or like Michelle said, you would find a development partner. And when you're approaching a development partner, I think primarily, and, and, and what I look for when I start to talk to people, okay, is, that, well, what are your goals? Um, do you have land that you want to offer and use as an affordable housing resource? Do you have political connections, or do you have a community-based connection that, in a particular community that you want to serve? How long do you want to be involved? Do you want to be involved either as kind of a, a silent landlord, or do you want to be involved in providing services over the long term, or property management, like with Susan's project, Beast Bay Recovery Project? And all of those things and those goals, that's important to get a handle on so that when you approach your development partner, you can write it all, you can start to flesh it all out and write it down. And there's going to be a, a tension as to what you can bring and, and, and as to what your development partner can give up. Because the way the financing is set up, there will be a level of control that people will need to, to maintain. All of the, the private lenders will want to see a significant level of financial capability. They'll require payment and performance guarantees. And they'll want to make sure that, that whoever is in the transaction has the financial backing to support the deal if things start to go south. Like Dan mentioned, um, in his project, there was a gap, and so they had to look at some of the money that the developers were actually going to make on the project to support co completion and operation of the project. So all of the banks are going to want to see that. Um, and again, an experienced development partner will have more financial assets to support that. But in putting their assets on the line, they'll also want a little bit more control in many circumstances. And so it's just all of those pieces that you'll start to flesh out as you negotiate. And usually the first document that we see is a memorandum of understanding. It's an informal agreement. Um, and then there are a variety of terms that the project can take. You could either form an LLC where you're both members of an LLC. If you're both tax exempt, that works very well in affordable housing projects. And the operating agreement will flesh out the roles of the organizations. Um, in other instances, you'll just see a development services agreement or some other side contract where the new development entity or the community-based organization or landholder will have a more of a contractual relationship with the developer, and the developer will, will it sounds like more what, what happened with your project, Susan, where you guys owned and constructed the project and then turned it over for operations and services. But I think that uh, the key to keep in mind is that because of the, the long-term guarantees that actually don't end at completion within a tax credit project, they will extend after completion into operations, that whoever's sponsoring that deal will have to make a commitment to their lenders as well and investors. And so they'll want to remain involved, at least for a little while. Can 
I just add that I think one of the things that none of the three of us talked about that Heather you just mentioned is that when we talk about seven or eight sources of financing, city, county, state, low income housing tax credits, there's often also a tranche of just capital from a conventional bank. And so those banks are gonna underwrite the partners in the deal and they have really high standards about the financial capacity of the partner. So I think that's just an important element to add in. We're going to move into question and answers, um, but before I do so, I want to introduce Gloria, who's here from Ebho. She's the executive director. Gloria, do you want to say anything? Uh, no, not really, other than just I'm really I'm glad to see so many people out um, here for this. And this, is, this is an amazing panel of experts that you all have this morning, so definitely should take advantage of all their wonderful expertise. So glad to have you here during one of the first events of Affordable Housing Week. We see the calendars for the rest of the week. So uh, please enjoy. And thanks to ACD for putting this on. Because I know there's been a lot, a lot of interest in like how can more organizations get involved in this very challenging but very rewarding work and so it's a lot. Great. Thank you for being here. I'm gonna just quickly show you we've got some of those handouts we talked about earlier. There's some resources out on the back table before you leave. Please feel free to pick them up. Um, this is the guidebook that we talked about. It's one of my favorite things, as I said. I use it all year long. It helps us to advocate for affordable housing. And then again, there's the calendar that we talked about. All right, so now is the moment in time for questions. And I know some of you said that, that you were gonna have some questions, but please just let me know. And I'm, I'm, I have a list of questions I'm gonna ask if no one else has them, but go right ahead. Okay, um, I'm sorry, what was your name? My name's Heather. 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 Um, so you mentioned the MOU, and you also mentioned LLC and other other English development services and all this stuff. I'm a small nonprofit in Richmond. Um, I do a lot of single family rehab, acquisition rehab, micro environments, ADUs, tiny homes, but I just do single family. Right. right. Now, I, I'm not sure I'm going to move into the rental because that's what we're talking about. We're talking about low income tax. That's for all rent stuff, right? Yes, it they is. They don't have that for single family, right? No, I think you know, and that's a very that's a good distinction. I was speaking within the context of rental, multifamily rental housing, or senior housing. So when uh, I'm trying to form, uh, move into our next level, I'm a Chodo. Well, actually, I was formed as a, under a, the Chodo designation. I'm a Community Housing Development Corporation nonprofit. Um, and we're moving right now into the acquisition development stage of single family uh, development, not mm -hmm. rental. Uh, my question would be is, because we don't have the fiscal capacity to do, uh, we haven't really developed, and it's in a sense where we've actually bought land and improved the land, but that's where we want to go. And I want to work with CHDC, maybe, I'm not sure. Uh, I'm working with some people in Florida and Baltimore to create a CDFI fund here in California because they're doing a lot of work out there in Baltimore and Florida. Uh, now, when it comes to this MOU, it, how much legal teeth does the MOU have? And how can I protect uh, our nonprofit uh, and the uh, intellectual property, so to speak, uh, that we have. Well, it, 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 it actually depends how the MOU is written as to how much teeth. I mean, I think that when most people approach an MOU, it's kind of an agreement to agree, a letter of intent, and this is generally what we want to be doing going forward. But the expectation between the parties generally, within the context of an MOU, is if things don't work out, it will be okay and we are not going to sue each other. I don't think I've ever had, I mean, we've definitely had people come to us when an L, a deal under an MOU has fallen apart, but I don't think I've seen anybody take action under an MOU. Um, and Heather, wouldn't you say that an MOU is the first step and yeah. the next step is more of a formal yes. partnership agreement? But, but it, it, is a, it is an agreement. Right? Correct. So there's something you can rely on, at least, right? You know, Correct. Even if it's Correct. conceptual. Yes, um, but they're usually softly worded to allow parties to terminate them, or I mean, you'll 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 see that they're they're much more softly worded than once you you could have an agreement among partners or or a development services agreement. Those are I think what people when they think of when they start to think of the next step that those are the kind of documents that you'd have. And then in terms of your intellectual property or you know, whatever your particular asset or issue or goal is, you would just start to outline that. And if it was particularly important to you and you wanted to address it in a particular way, you'd need to make it clear to your partner and, and write it down. Is that something that anybody can do it for? Would you need an attorney to do that for you? 
<laughs> I think plenty of people do it without an attorney. Do I think it's probably better with an attorney? Yes, but that's you know it's my profession. Um, I think that the one thing that an attorney will will offer you is if they have an understanding of the field, they can help you see the pitfalls or or the benefits of, of working things a particular way. So. I mean, I, I would say that the, the benefit of having the attorney is not to make the MOU give you teeth to enforce in some fashion. It's really, I think, as Heather uh, indicates, it's really to make sure that you're thinking broadly about all the elements that you will have addressed. Um, you know, because particularly if you have not done it before and you don't have a form to work from and you haven't worked with the other organization before, you, you're just not gonna, and, and none of us ever do, you can't anticipate all the things that you really need to start thinking about early. And yeah, I would just say this is a really, it's a really important issue because it is how you sort of begin to kind of frame your agreement and when you see expectations and how they, they kind of play out. And you know, I, I'm kind of almost laughing because we were about to, you know, apply for tax credits with the church and it takes, sometimes it takes, you know, years, as people have said. I mean, you know, you, you do this for five years before you can even go get your the major funding you need. And in this particular development, the, at one point, you know, the pastor left in the church, completely kind of ignored a, a big part of the MOU. <laughs> we kind of thought, uh-oh. But, you know, it was really that, it, you know, we just kind of said, okay, we're going to have to live with this. But you could... And, and, and you know we, we actually completely changed the completely changed the arrangement and it's going to work out fine. But it, it is something that um, although it's you know it's not necessarily you know I couldn't imagine going to court over that. I mean I think it would be crazy to do that. You know it's it's how you're putting together your relationship and your project. So it's it's a pretty important thing to to do a good job on. Okay, I have the question in the back and then this. Thank you. My name is Pat Powers. I'm actually here with the Sierra Club, although we have no intention of being a developer. But what we this is kind of a, a comment incentive for potential developers, and then maybe a question for the panel is there's a state law SB 375 that was passed in 2008 that calls for increasing the coexistence of transportation and you know public transit and housing uh, development and the Sierra Club is really supporting the idea of what are called priority development areas in in this uh, part part of the state which calls for you know all kinds of housing to be developed close to uh, good public transit in order to cut down on greenhouse gases, vehicle miles, that sort of thing. And there's actually a provision in the law that allows for CEQA streamlining for such developments. And the question in a way for, uh, so there's some, some, that's the incentive part. But the question for the panel maybe is, have you heard of any such projects that have taken advantage of that provision, it, we all of a sudden realize it's like there's this opportunity, but it's not clear how it's going to play out for the development incentive. And there are 45 priority development areas throughout Alameda County, so there's place designated by their city or county. So there's some real opportunities, but have any of you heard of anybody actually doing it yet? <laughs> Well, I, maybe I can quickly just sort of broaden the discussion a little sure. and then we can talk about this specific provision vis-a-vis -vis CEQA. Um, there's a lot of incentive for affordable housing to be built near good public transportation beyond this particular issue. Um, there's minimum scoring criteria in our tax credit program around location, proximity to transit. Uh, there's some new funding sources available, the cap and trade funding. Um, so proximity to transit is, is very, uh, is a very uh, highly encouraged attribute of affordable housing. So, but I don't know if the if Heather wants to speak more specifically around the sequence streamlining vis-a-vis SB 375. Yes, there. I mean, there are a handful of recent exemptions. 
um, that allow, it, it does make it easier to do, to do projects near tra um, transit priority. I have tried to use it <clears throat> three or four times. <laughs> Once I ran into a historic issue, uh, another time I did run into, you still have to do somewhat of an initial study, or you know, do, make sure that you're not tripping over certain bigger issues like historic um, or traffic. So I've run into those a few times, but yeah, we've used it three or four times. It's useful. It would be useful to have even better exemptions, I guess, but, but Jerry Brown is working on it. So. Yeah, we'll follow up with you. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, uh, my name is Christine and I um, live in uh, the city of Berkeley with my sister Francine, um, who I care for. Um, and I am um, also on the Commission on Disability for the city of Berkeley, but I'm not speaking on their behalf. Uh, there was a developer who came and spoke um, at our town hall meeting about his project and it was a project for people with disabilities and families, etc. And um, I was, well, first of all, I'd like to thank you for being here. Thank you for outreaching. I commend you for what you're doing. Um, but I was kind of perplexed because um, before he had presented on a different occasion, I had asked him about affordable housing, and he got really upset. Um, and I was wondering, why is it that this person and other developers don't, are not encouraged to do affordable housing with their projects? What, what is it that gets them so upset? I see, obviously, it's possible. And you know maybe a lot of work, but what is it that you know? I, I don't get it. Maybe you can enlighten me. So your question is really about market rate versus affordable. Thank you. And yes. Why would a why would a for-profit developer choose to go with affordable housing versus yes. market rate housing? Yes. Thank you. It's an excellent question. I'm going to see how you guys answer that. And <laughs> I'm going to jump in. <laughs> thank he, thank he, you. He wants to make money. Thank you. He just wants to make money. <laughs> That's it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> it's hard to know without knowing, having been there, knowing who it was and what the thing was about. But, you know, so in, in Berkeley, one of the things that's happening is um, there are uh, market rate developments that are trying to get approved, and the community is starting to say, hey, wait a minute, we want you to do more for the community, and that includes doing more affordable units. And that can. Uh, can cause some pushback from the developers who that because it changes their economics and, and from their perspective probably makes it worse because they're going to charge less for that unit than they can get at market and I have no idea if that's what that was about I'm kind of curious but we'll <laughs> talk off one <laughs> yeah, so there's, you know there's a lot of localities that require a certain percentage of affordable housing or they require a, a payment of a fee in lieu that type of thing um, there's a lot of us that will work with um, with market rate developers um, in conjunction with them. Um, so uh, the, the project I spoke about today, you know, that's inclusionary, that's actually part of a larger uh, community that involves um, actually daylighting of a creek and uh, market rate units as well as affordable units. Um, all of us you know, have done and continue to do affordable housing in conjunction with market rate developers who have a requirement that they do affordable. I, I want to add something to that, which is when a developer goes to a city council and says, I want to build something on this land, that land has you know, zoning ordinances and it has a general plan designation. And if he brings a development to the city council that specifically matches exactly what has, that site has been designated, then the city council can just go ahead and approve it. But as soon as he asks for, or she asks for, it's not always a guy, um, as soon as they are asking for something that is above and beyond what has already been approved on that site, the community then has the right to say that there is a community benefit that we're going to expect from you. If you want more density, you want a higher building, you want more units, we want something from you. Now that's not necessarily something that most local planning departments are really aware of and the staff needs to be educated and really understand that you know for every project that comes forward there's money to be made and some of that money could actually go back into the community if by way of a community development a public benefit agreement that the that the project developer and and the local government uh, agree to and inclusionary housing which some cities in the county have and some don't 
is one of those community benefit type agreements. And so a density bonus, meaning I'll let you go up another story if some of those units are affordable, that's another way of doing it. Um, you know, putting cash into a services uh, um, fund is another one. That one, actually, Livermore has a really great um, community service benefit agreement, and every development has to actually pay into a fund that provides services to low-income people throughout the community. So there is always a way to get that developer to kick in, but you've got to, as residents of the community, expect that your city staff and your city council and your planning commission understand that and push them to ask for that. That's my take. Okay. This. Uh, I wanted to try to understand tying constraints. So, right? It seems like all of these projects are taking a certain amount of period of time. I have experience with residential, so that's something I may have to in mind. But then on these type of projects here, if you look at it as phases of development, where is most of the time? Let's repeat the question. Yeah. I'll take it, sure. And we can all share in. So the gentleman says he has a lot of experience doing residential construction, but he's wondering what takes so long with affordable housing and what are the different phases and why? Is that right? Okay, excellent. So um, I think there are two things that can take a lot of time on affordable housing. Um, the thing that's very unique to affordable housing is that we need to apply for multiple sources of funding. And there's sort of chicken and egg problem with who's the first into your project? Uh, where do you get the first bit of money? Because once you start getting money in, that's kind of can leverage others. So oftentimes the first money in is from your city or county, the early money in, and you need that money before you um, can even apply for tax credits. The tricky thing about tax credits is there's only two competitive rounds during the course of any one year, and you're competing against projects in some ways in your region and other ways across the state. So you really only have two opportunities. So if your project, and you, you can never exactly tell if you're going to win or not going in because it all depends on who else is applying. But if you don't get funded during those two times a year, you have to wait for the next year. So you could have a really good project that just doesn't score quite well enough, and you're just kind of going back in multiple years. Um, so I'd say funding is kind of one of the big drivers. Secondly is that getting entitlements, and this isn't necessarily specific to affordable housing, so your experience is probably very relevant here. You know, getting your planning, zoning, and design review uh, approvals varies tremendously from locality to locality. Some cities and counties, are, some cities are easier, some are harder. So that's always tricky with development, but with affordable can take longer because you can get more community opposition, which can really slow the project down. So I don't know, my co-panelists have other things to add, but I think those are the two biggest time drivers. Money. Getting the money. And occasionally you run into something like environmental contamination or historic, and that, that can make things up too. Yeah, I mean, my only comment is that there really is way more demand for supply for the funding for affordable housing. So that's, you know, I mean, you're, if you're sitting around waiting to get your tax credits, it's because they, they, you know, there's three times or four times as many applications as money every, every round. I think, I think it's important to, let's, let's, t let's explain the tax credit situation. I mean, there's a couple of statewide pools, but for the most part, the state gets that allocation from the federal government. The uh, state then allocates it across the entire state. And Alameda County is part of the Northern Bay region, and that includes Alameda, Contra Costa, Sonoma, Napa, and Solano County, correct? Uh, not, not Moran. And Marin. Marin. And Marin. 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 Yeah. I missed one. And there are enough tax credits to do three, maybe four projects around. So there's not even enough tax credits to do one in every single one of those counties. So what we're talking about, so twice a year, so maybe Alameda County will get two projects a year. And so that's the real funnel. Everybody's trying to get through that funnel to get down and get that access to that money. What's the betting? So what's the what? The betting. So the vetting process has to do with, um, it's called the Qualified Allocation Plan, and the state, uh, the state Tax Credit Allocation Committee chooses what they think are the highest priority projects from a, what does the project have? And you know, some of that stuff would be things like, um, is it, is it uh, environmental, does it have lead and platinum status, does it have, I don't know. Yeah, there's that. basically some threshold criteria, so you have to have, certain things all, right off the bat, like the developer experience, 
your site has to have certain location amenities, proximity to transit, schools, et cetera. It has to have meet green criteria. There's like a basic threshold. But you don't even bother to apply unless you make that basic threshold because the program is so competitive that you're not going to get picked unless you meet that threshold. And that's all available online. Then it moves to a tiebreaker. And this is what we all you know, scrutinize with the tiniest of microscopes that we're, we're looking at how we're going to score on the tiebreaker. And the tiebreaker has changed over time. But currently what the tiebreaker is, is simply put, it's a ratio of public funds that you have already lined up for your project, essentially versus what amount of tax credits you're asking for. Uh, it's kind of a, it's like a pretty specific formula, but overall it measures what other money, public money, do you already have in the deal. Uh, because the, the policy goal of that is to leverage the tax credit investment with other public money. So that's what it comes down to. Um, affordability has been a tiebreaker in the past, but now that's really just built into the threshold requirement. Great. All right, let's, uh, let, me, let me go here and then I'll come back to you. I'm sorry, can you just enlighten me about tax credits and is, is this what makes affordable housing affordable? Uh, I mean, yeah, I guess here's what I'm asking is, is if you're building a pro, if a for-profit man's building a, a, a hundred unit building, and nonprofit building right next to the same exact building. They're going up for the same price, $3 million. Uh, what makes it affordable? What makes this nonprofit able to rent this at 25% off the market price versus this guy over here? Can you address that? You know, the basic issue there is it's the funding package, it's the financing. So if you're thinking about your market rate developer, and it takes, I'm going to use big numbers, $100 million to build the building. Probably too big. Let's do $10 million. <laughs> so $10 million to build the building. He's going to put 10% in, so that's a $1 million. And he's going to leverage $9 million in a mortgage, right? And his rents have to support that $9 million plus the operating costs. So he is renting it at this much up here to every single household and it covers his mortgage and he can make that deal go. That's financeable and the banks are going to come in and says, yes, we're going to give you $9 million. Okay. In the affordable housing world, that first mortgage is about two million, 20%. And then on top of that, you have tax credits, 40 to 50%. And then on top of that, you have local government, some grant sources, and that's how you get that. And you're not paying on any of it except for this $2 million. And that allows them to discount the rent so much that you can actually rent it to low-income folks who are not paying you know, twice their income or 80% you know, of their income to live there. So it's all about those leveraged financing sources. You heard Susan and the others say, you know, eight, ten sources of financing to make that work versus the market rate developer who puts his own cash in and then gets a Loan. And that bank loan has to be serviced. Just like your mortgage on your house, you have to make monthly payments and you have to have enough money every month. The bank is not going to loan you, a good bank is not going to loan you more than you can afford to pay. <laughs> so that's that's how the affordable housing. And that tax credit money comes from what source? I mean. So the tax credit financing is really interesting and correct me if I'm wrong, you guys, but essentially what happens is the federal government allocates a certain amount of money as tax credits and then they allocate it down to each of the states. And what happens is that <clears throat> the state doesn't actually have cash. What they have is a promise to someone that they can actually get a tax credit against their income taxes. And so you have large corporations Sometimes banks, a lot of times banks, but um, large corporations come in and they say, hmm, for the value of 15 years worth of tax credits, I will give you X amount of dollars cash now, and then I will take those tax credits over a 15 year period. So all of these projects that we've been talking about are partnerships with an investor who comes in and says, I need, because I have a profit, I need a tax credit over the next 15 years. It will save my business money. I can pay you upfront cash now, this big amount of money, but what I will get over a 15 year period will save me enough money that it's more than worth my while to invest now. And so large corporations come in 
and they are the backbone of the affordable housing industry. The only thing that I would add to that is, um, you know, there's the development period, the sort of the financing to build the thing, and then you got to run it. Um, and the running it over time, um, you know, the, the deeper the affordability, we are all sort of um, increasingly incentivized to uh, address uh, extremely low, low income, special needs populations, populations who really may be able to afford, um, you know, very, very little of any rent. Um, and so we also need to look for ways to support the ongoing operations, ongoing operations of the buildings, either through uh, Section 8, different capitalized operating reserves, uh, different financing sources to make the operations work. Uh, because oftentimes, even though we're able to bring the capital, the building costs down through these uh, development subsidies, ongoing operations are not covered by rents alone. Alright, uh, let's go here and then I'll come back there in the morning. Your, your inclusionary housing, Hayward has an inclusionary housing policy? Um, yes it does. Okay, so you take in Lou, please. It does, on their, yeah, so their rental, you can opt in to include, oh, Andy, because I, I, I should know it, because we wrote it for them, but, <laughs> but I didn't. Yeah, that you can opt in to pay the, the rental, yeah, right. You can either opt in to build inclusionary units in a rental project or pay the fee. And ownership, I think, is the same way, right? And it's like it's seven, it's seven point five percent and ten percent. Yeah, there, there, there is an inclusionary requirement, um, and then uh, developers also can the parker we can so they can provide it internally, which, which actually doesn't happen a lot. Um, and then uh, the statute also provides some provision for um, working with. A, a, a not for profit to actually transfer instead of paying those fees to the city because sometimes the city says, Well, I'm getting this money, but what am I going to do with it? Um, you know, they, they can work with us to develop something, but there's got to be some other benefits. There's some flexibility to do it, but it's not, it's discretionary upon the, of the, it's upon the city council discretion. So, my, my question further is uh, with this in lieu payment. My experience has been that in loose never enough, and it puts that obligation on the county or the jurisdiction who takes the in loose, right? So, and they're not developers, so they got to go find somebody to take this obligation. Um, do you, if you work with a nonprofit that does single family as opposed to rental, because sometimes there are, and this, this is the inclusionary applied rental too? Or is it yes, both. It's seven? both. It does. So can you transfer rental in, inclusion or in lieu to single family for sale? If it, if it Usually it's deposited in an affordable housing trust fund, and as long as it's consistent with the the reason that the ordinance was enacted, you can use it for that. So okay. yes, I don't. And it's not if it's if it's paid by a. It, it totally depends on jurisdiction. They all have different yeah. rules. But what about Hayward? What yeah. do they do? I, we have to ask Hayward. We're not Hayward. Yes. Not you can call. Hayward. You can call. <laughs> you can call the city. So we're the, we're Alameda County. Okay. So Alameda, um, County. Alameda County, we're countywide program. We have our jurisdictional hat is the unincorporated county, but we run programs countywide. Does, so count, does the county have in lieu? The county does not have in lieu in the unincorporated county. Not that we wouldn't want to see something like that. They examine and look at. Can it be? Can Hayward's in lieu transfer to Alameda County? No, it's within a jurisdiction. Yes. Um, so Hi, how are you? Hi, how are you? It's good. Um, so I'm wondering, if, if, I don't know if anyone on the panel, um, you know, I've been reading lately that uh, about the, the, the potential for the federal government to go through with um, lowering the corporate tax rate, which would disincentivize um, uh, corporations to invest in low-income housing tax credits. I'm wondering if any of you have, you know, if, have heard anyone who's talked about if that does happen, like if they do significantly lower these taxes, what percentage of low-income housing tax credits may remain, and then if it also happens, will there is there a kind of a plan B in, in terms of that, that? That's actually. I mean, we we are all living that life right now. Honestly, we're in the mix on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, go ahead. So, um, I mean, it, it is all immediately in our minds. So basically, uh, immediately after the presidential election, um, you know, those who are, who are essentially trying to close deals found that 20% of our money went away. Uh, and in some cases, the investors walked. 
Uh, Even though there hadn't actually been any changes in the corporate tax law at all, it just the because it's a private market, they were reacting with sort of you know conservative. They all, they all kind of pulled back and said, okay, now what do we do? Um, there, there has been, I would say, some stability uh, or some sense of consensus among the major investors about what's going to happen. Um, you know, what we do is when we run our financial projections, um, those financial projections actually do account for the, for the marginal tax rate at 35%. Um, Right now, I would say that most investors are now assuming uh, a 20 to 25 percent marginal tax rate. It depends upon the investor. Um, and if you really, you know, talk to them and say, "Well, what do you think really is going to happen?" None of them think that's going to happen. Um, you know, if, if anything's going to happen, they're thinking that the marginal tax rate for corporations will go down to more like 28, something like that. But they are, they are counting now today. For that to reduce basically what we're what we're getting for something that hasn't happened yet. The value the value that we've been getting is, is reduced, and we actually came forward with Measure A one funds as sort of an emergency measure to fund those projects that needed to close this spring or were about to apply for tax credits. So we we stepped in the Alameda, Alameda County Board of Supervisors stepped in to solve that emergency issue back in February and March. Lena. Hi, um, thank everybody for your comments. And I have two questions, one easy, one maybe a little more challenging. Um, so the first question is, what is the usual formula or range for a developer fee? And then when you are partnering uh, with, you know, a bigger nonprofit, a less experienced nonprofit, how do you usually split that? That's sort of the first question. The second one is more specifically to Susan with regard to your uh, the project that you did, which is essentially sort of a preservation project. like. Did acquisition rehab of an existing structure with, you know, some degree of issues probably associated with it? But given the conversation about the length of time that it takes to do, you know, um, up from the ground project and then also the cost, the tax credit, the financing, why aren't we seeing more of these kinds of, you know, acquisition rehab sort of infill projects that you've done, or or are there are they out there? Well, do you want to go in reverse order? I can take that question, then we can do the developer fee. Want to do it. So, uh, just to, re re okay. to reiterate the question, um, why, given how time consuming and expensive it is to do new construction affordable housing, why aren't we seeing more acquisition rehab? I have to challenge the assumption that acquisition rehab is any cheaper, easier, or more efficient than new construction. In fact, oftentimes we find new construction so much more straightforward and easy to do. Um, with, I think for those of you out there who've ever bought an old building, uh, no matter how much exploratory work and studies and everything you do, uh, before you buy it, you always find surprises, uh, costly surprises. And in fact, especially around seismic issues, um, handicapped accessibility, uh, stru structural is really the big one. Um, that's a huge challenge, combined with the fact that there's really nothing existing that's cheap out there that someone hasn't already bought. Uh, particularly, say, in the Oakland marketplace, there's a lot of political interest in acquiring existing buildings and preserving the affordability. And as much as we'd love to do that, um, the nonprofits are often wildly outbid by speculative investors who just want to park their money in a booming, real estate market um, and will come in and wildly overpay for buildings that have basically been run right into the ground um, and that's what's really gobbling up a lot of the stock so while i do think it's important to blend an approach of you know creating new housing and preserving existing affordable housing uh, this piece of it is very very hard um, so uh, does that kind of get at your question a little? It's very important yeah. to do, but it's not straightforward. And I saw a lot of nodding in the room from people who have bought existing films, shaking their heads, you know, it's not easy. Uh, but someone else want to take the developer fee question? I, I'm going to, obviously maybe one of you guys knows the actual numbers at this point, because I'm a little, a little uh, less on top of that right now. I know that uh, a lot, all the funding sources actually have caps as to how much you can take, and it's, it's limited. But I'll get a little bit to the split question, which is actually a pretty interesting, meaty, challenging one. 
Um, you know, that's a, always a big negotiation, and it's usually something that has to happen pretty, you know, people want, everyone wants to know, right? And you want to get that out on the table and put that, have an early conversation about that, because it's, it's one of the few upsides to these projects. And, um, you know, there's things, so there's things you have to take into account. You know, you take into account who's going to do most of the work. Uh, you know, who's going to, uh, you know, are there things like where the site come from? You know, that's something that if the site came from a, an institution that there's value there. Who's going to take more, most of the risk? Um, you know, we, uh, Heather had talked about guarantees and things like that. Um, one of the things that also happens that I don't know if anyone talked about on these projects is that it can be hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars that the developer or somebody has to put into these deals before they the, the tax credits and the loans close, just to get through, uh, you know, your entitlements, pay the architect to do working drawings. Where is that going to come from? So you try to basically balance all this stuff, and you get to a number that you hope makes sense to people. And you know, honestly, I think that's one of the really tough things about these partnerships because, you know, that. You know, that usually is going to be really skewed towards the, you know, quote, capacity developer. And, you know, that's just a tough one, you know? I mean, if you're, if, you know, and, I, and so I think, um, I think that's a really meaty, tough question. I don't know if one of you guys want to talk about briefly how much there is. I, I just want to quickly touch on the, the sort of acquisition rehab question. Um, uh, I, I would say that, you know, part of it is that, um, you know, part of our mission is really to develop uh, more affordable housing. So, you know, we, we have a skew to try to, to do new construction because we want to add to the number of units out there. Um, but, I, but I would also add to that, though, that, um, you know, to the extent that um, we work in localities where revitalization uh, is really a priority, um, you know, we, we do work in neighborhoods where we do do acquisitions um, because, uh, the housing stock um, is not very good. Um, you know, we, we we need to improve the neighborhood. Um, so the example I'll give you is um, there's an area in here we call the Jackson Triangle, uh, and you know we are working in a neighborhood actually with a, a church there, um, Glen Tidings, um, where we acquired a building. It's actually uh, an apartment building they owned. We acquired it from them, um, and then we are going to partner with them to do a, a rehab of that property. Um, and we're doing these things, we're actually combining re what we call resyndication, so uh, resyndicating some of our existing properties together with other properties. When you do it together, you create um, certain financial efficiencies to, that makes it work. Um, so so the, so the acquisition rehab thing, I think a lot of part depends upon what your priorities are uh, and what the, what the locality's priorities are. Uh, on the on the fee splits, it, it really. I mean, we worked with a lot of local partners, and it completely depends upon the individual circumstances, and and really what each individual each group's long term goals are. Um, you know, we, we have worked with some organizations who, you know, what what they're interested in is, um, they may have a site. And what they want to do is they want to redevelop that site because they want to build um, their service provider and they're trying to create new space for themselves. And so, you know, we'll, we'll work with them to create that space. And that's, that's where some of their, that's what they're getting. Um, we've worked with some organizations where what they want to do is they want to provide services on the site or they want to see cash flow over time. I mean, there's a whole different variety of ways that uh, the 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 partnership can work. It, it you have to know what you you're interested in. And then we have to sort of you know when I talk about that communication thing, that's when you sort of sit down and figure out what are your priorities, what are my priorities, how, you know what are our risks, what are our responsibilities, and and you can sort that stuff out. I just want to add that for a local group maybe that has land that that needs to make some money, developer fee is not the only way to do it. There's 
carry, there's seller carrybacks, there's long-term lease, capitalized long-term lease payments, there's, there's different mechanisms in addition to developer fee as a way to get paid. I'm going to come to you, but just let me answer the question around developer fee really quickly. So the Alameda County has a set of policies and procedures, and we're going to actually show you where you can go and look at our underwriting requirements, but our requirements are that the developer not take more than $2 million out of the deal. So, you know, um, there's a, there's the value of cash now, and then there's the value of getting paid over time, and there's, um, you know, there's, there's giving them a higher fee and having them put back in, and so we evaluate every deal differently, but, you know, we sort of have a set cap um, on what we allow our developers to take because um, there were some guidelines at the state, and we just sort of adopted those a long time ago. We've just been following them for a while. All right, you had a question yeah, here. My question is about the technology sector. So obviously, one of the negatives about the Bay Area probably is that the technology sector has been incredibly successful. Uh, limited supply of housing stock has driven up prices. But on the positive side, obviously, uh, a lot of creativity in the technology sector, a lot of innovation. So I'm just curious, are you guys seeing anything um, kind of creative on the technology side in terms of innovation, in terms of addressing affordable housing and or the partnership side, right? Because obviously there's a lot of capital at Apple, Google, and Facebook. And so is that, what are, what are they doing to kind of work with you guys? So we, we, we do some work on the peninsula where most of those technology companies are there. You know, there are some, yeah, I think, you know, Google recently announced um, that they're dedicating uh, a fairly significant amount of money. It, it was really, honestly, it was the result of um, uh, 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 an agreement with some local activists um, in order to create some local funding. Um, how that funds, how those funds are coming out, yeah, we don't really totally know yet. They actually are going out and looking for another organization to help them uh, put those funds out the door. Um, so on the just like making money available, you know, we haven't seen a lot of it that is unique. You know, they have some of the technology companies have invested in credits, but that's not, you know, unique. Um, you know, I, so set, set aside the, the technology as an industry, um, you know, and then think about just sort of like how, how can we use technology in ways to, to better meet our mission? Um, and, you know, I think that we, we would address that by, by talking about how we're really sort of trying to bring technology to the residents. Um, and there's a variety of ways in which we're all trying to do that. Um, and then, you know, there are ways in which we are trying to use technology to make the process more efficient. Um, and there's, there's a long way to go on that. I would say we're super behind the eight ball on how technology can, um, you know, revolutionize our sector. I think one of the key areas that um, is notably lack of innovation is in construction technology, mm -hmm. that we're still using the same types of building methods that we have for 100 years, and there's so much room for innovation in bringing costs down, because uh, the cost of construction is a huge challenge that we face in our industry. So. I feel like there's a lot of room for innovation in that. I would agree with Andy that the tech sector doesn't seem to have stepped up in a big way to acknowledge their role in the housing displacement and crisis that we're facing. They have in certain pockets. Um, some certain philanthropies have given to support particularly homeless housing in San Francisco. I think that's something visible. Um, but I think what we've seen in our industry is tech companies saying, hey, we can lend you some money. Uh, we're like, that's okay, we, we can borrow money from lots of places, so, and a few have invested in low-income housing tax credits, but I think there's a lot of room for um, growth and collaboration in, in, in our sector and theirs, but I think we're pretty behind on it. I, I would also say that I think uh, you'd like to see more happening in the East Bay. Um, I mean, a lot of the efforts are really focused on San Francisco and Santa Clara and San Mateo, that is, is happening, and we're not, you know, many of their workers are now, frankly, commuting from East Bay. So uh, I know it's actually something that some of the local electives have started talking about, um, and hopefully we can start. Great. All right. Any other questions? Yes. Uh, yeah, I wonder what the, the mindset is of each affordable housing. It's a certain personality, certain thought, <laughs> and maybe more than philanthropic. So I want to get an idea of, of your mindset. Uh, what's in it for you? Because I, I used to develop back in 89, 90, and now I'm in technology, I'm in software. 
So it's, I'd like to converge that, but I don't know the mindset of what's in it for me. I mean, so I, I would just say that for me, you know, it's, it's kind of beautiful work, right? I mean, you're, you're basically, you know, it's kind of what these guys also said, is, you know, as a younger person being interested in cities and community and building, but I, I think in nonprofits, there's just not that many nonprofits that get to do what we get to do in terms of just the uh, intellectual um, interest, the amazing product that has really great impact on people's lives and cities. I mean, we can all drive by our buildings, you know, and, and do it all the time. So I, for me, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a business. You know, you're out there in the in the world in the business world trying to make tough business decisions. And, fr and frankly, I think it's harder than market rate development. Mm -hmm. uh, but you're doing uh, really great stuff in your community. It's, I think it's a, a you know, that's kind of what's in it for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's, it's good work. Thank you. Yeah, I would agree. You. I think that personally, it's super, super satisfying because it is that combination of extremely complex, mm -hmm. um, kind of high risk in many ways. Mm -hmm. um, and just very high reward when you meet people who were living in an, under an overpass or in their cars or seniors who were paying every penny of social security to sleep on a couch and you see their faces and you hear their experience of what it's like to finally have a safe, beautiful place to live that they don't have to worry every day and kids that you know aren't moving around or living in shelters but they have a quiet, safe home. There is nothing more rewarding I, I think it's, it's awesome work. Yeah. I, as I mentioned, I grew up at Hayward. You know, I grew up in a low-income community. Um, I'm first generation, um, so my parents both immigrated. Um, and, you know, I'm the first in our family to, you know, go beyond high school. And in fact, my dad did not get past seventh grade. So mm -hmm. for me, the work is really, it's very personal. Mm -hmm. um, I would also say that, um, you know, it's important for me as um, you know, sort of uh, uh, vaguely a person of color to really be involved in trying to um, improve our community. Uh, the last thing I would say is that, you know, we, you know, you, you live your life day by day. And so uh, it, it is incredibly rewarding when, when we do those grand openings and we see people move in, when it takes 15 years, really, you know, you, you, you do it because the people that are next to you share those uh, those values, and every day I go to work and I work with people who, you know, I'm really proud to be working with. So that is really driving my day. Wow, thank you. I am a step removed, right? Because I'm mired in the paper, right? Uh, I, my, <laughs> I am not, and I, I do not have a hammer. I am not, you know, um, meeting with the residents on a day-to-day -day basis. But I can see out of the window of my office projects that I've worked on, um, and I get to work with people like this, and it's an amazing community, and, and it's amazing to work with the mission people, and know that the work that you're doing each day. To the growth of your community and the betterment of the community. I, I would not diminish the role of the attorneys. I mean, we all use attorneys a lot um, because they involve tax credits, and so they're they're just really uh, esoteric. And the lawyers play a big role, um, and they are all equally, I think, uh, dedicated to the work that we do. All right, I'm going to do a quick time check and ask your opinion on this. We had originally intended there to be a networking session in between this phase and the sort of a quick presentation on Measure A1. It seems like this question and answer is going really well, and you guys still have more questions. Should we continue with that? Okay. You. Oh, just a couple of questions. One, I was wondering if you could speak a little more about the resyndication process. You mentioned that, and I was interested in learning a little more about that. And um, second question, a couple of weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago now, the county supervisors had um, a developer of prefab, uh, oh, yeah. you know, con almost containerized units um, do a presentation. I was wondering what your feeling is about that type of housing and if any of you have done that kind of development. I guess it's happening in San Francisco now and Alameda County is looking at doing some of that kind of development here, primarily for the homeless, I think. Is when I do the... Oh, I'll, I'll take that one. Um, 
take the modular ones. Friendly people. I'll take the modular ones. So I think that um, the gentleman that asked the question is sort of like where can technology and housing intersect? I mean, I think overall there's just a lot of interest in how can we rethink the production methods we've been using um, and how can that help bring costs down and as we can lower costs, we can build more for the same amount, right? So I really understand this kind of interest in new technology, including prefabricated. Um, it's still a bit of an untested field. Uh, one of the main builders of, uh, well, one of the main producers of prefabricated units um, went out of business recently in the Bay Area, and I know there's a few others that are coming up, and there's one affordable housing project um, in San Leandro, I think, that's using prefabricated. Grand opening later this week. Yeah. 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 So that would be really interesting. It's a bit of an untested field. Regarding more specifically the idea of uh, these sort of container-type housing for homeless, um, I, I have, uh, there, there's, I think, some questions to be raised about that. Um, uh, what it feels to me the way it's described leads out is how how are the operations actually going to work with these containerized units? Uh, who's going to manage them? How are services going to be provided? Um, how how will how will it actually run rather than sort of like how will it look? Um, I'm also a little concerned because the units that I've seen um, seem really to be designed and constructed for tiny millennials, like big, literally they're very narrow. There is a little flip down desk for your laptop and a really narrow shower. And, and having built homeless housing um, in the past and currently building homeless housing, that design type um, doesn't seem necessarily appropriate um, for the populations that we've served. It really seems like the mindset of it is for you know the millennial who is spending just like seven hours sleeping in their unit and then leaving for their work and their life and so I just sort of the design of it uh, as it stands just raises a lot of questions but I think the fact that we're thinking about innovation is really important so I don't want to kind of diminish that I think it just raises some questions any other thoughts about that I mean, I agree I mean I think I mean, we're not, I, I think it is something that's worth looking at, for sure, because, I mean, if you can do something that gets people out of homelessness that's, that's less expensive and faster, I mean, we have to look at it. Uh, for us, and, and I, I kind of have the same, some of the same concerns, and also we know from uh, working with folks and doing some surveys and seeing what people want, is that people want to have apartments that are more like, uh, that are the same as, um, you know, everyone else in the community has. So that's what we pref would prefer to do if we can, but you know, those are the things that, that do take longer. I mean, we we traditionally, uh, 20 years ago, when we talked about homeless housing, it was um, uh, you know taking an old hotel and making it a you know taking a hotel where people might have had to go down the hallway to go to the restroom, renovating it. You know, maybe 100 or 200 people could live in those places. You know, now we're re-renovating those places. We're looking at when we are in a situation like that of, of creating one bedroom units with cooking in the unit. It's pretty important to not tell people they have to go downstairs to make a meal. So, the, so you know, it, 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 but having said that, I agree, there's, there's definitely something, to, something there to think about for sure when you're, when you're in such a, a tough cost market and you have such a big problem. I, I think from what we've seen from really the studies is that, and, and people's experience, um, is, is that the, the, the cost savings aren't really, we haven't seen the cost savings there yet. Um, so uh, just on a per unit basis, the building of the thing isn't necessarily cheaper. Um, uh, the theory is, is that you can build it faster. Yeah. Um, there, there are some production issues that's involved with that. I mean, the reason why, well, the, 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 the modular and prefab are different, um, right. but there, there are some issues about fabrication that can really trip you up. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but hopefully it goes faster. I think, you know, we are, we are definitely looking at it. Um, we have a lot of the same concerns about livability, um, but, you know, we're all trying to get it. We don't want to take 15 years. We want this to go faster. Um, you know, we all see the people that are living on, you know, on the streets, and we want to respond quickly. So that is really why we're looking at it. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
So really quickly, there are two projects in Alameda County. One is opening this week. It's on um, our affordable housing week. It's on Wednesday. And it's called um, the San Leandro Grand Opening, hosted by Bridge. It's at 11 a.m. at 1400 San Leandro Boulevard. And that's one modular project that has been built. And right next door is the next one. And it's a grand opening and a ground breaking all, all at once. Mm -hmm. And the next one, uh, we actually have financing in. And so the county is an investor in that. And I'm sorry, I can't remember what your first oh, question was. Oh, re-syndication? Yeah, re-syndication. So, um, <laughs> sort of to oversimplify, um, when buildings get at the end of their either useful life or their tax credit compliance period, there's sort of an opportunity to look at how do we bring in some new resources maybe to change the financing, take out the old financing and substitute it with new, bring in some capital, renovate the building. Resyndication can mean many things. You can bring in new money at a lower interest rate, or you can bring in tax credit. So each project is slightly different. You may want to resyndicate a building in your existing portfolio. You may want to partner with a group that has a building that they've operated for a long time and their board is tired and they want to go. Um, so I think in general, it's a, it's a broad term used to sort of like bringing in new money, um, improving the building, potentially lowering the um, mortgage payments, things like that. Is that kind of broad enough for? Yeah. We can talk more later All if right. you have a specific. Um, Christine, and then you. Oh, well, I'm sorry, there's a woman in the back. Go ahead. You have an asked question. I'm finding myself in graduate school in affordable housing. Would you take a question that represents affordable housing in 101? Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, you talked about a tax credit and how the competition is so fierce. Uh, could you please talk a bit more specifically about other sources of funding for affordable housing in the county? That is not a basic <laughs> question. That's a very advanced question. Uh, and I'm glad you asked. So, well, I'll take a little stab and maybe we can all end. Um, so every project is different, but in general, the normal kind of ratio of if, you're, if you've got $10 million, um, you need about 25% of that, so say $2.5 million, from some local source. So some counties have money, like we're talking about here with the A1 funds. Some cities have money through their housing trust funds. It used to be under the era when we had redevelopment agencies, cities very likely had quite a bit of money that they would put into affordable housing. So I would say about a quarter of the money comes from these local government sources. Um, if you get low income housing tax credits, that's about say 50% of the money comes from low income housing tax credits. And then you've got 25% to cobble together from other places. So in the past, the state of California has had a program called the MHP program that was um, pretty much exhausted. There's little programs at the state now for uh, this cap and trade program that we talked about. There's some veterans money. Um, so that's kind of other. And then finally, you have what you call private capital. So that's just regular bank money, uh, maybe slightly below market rate interest. Usually what we don't have, and this is a question I get all the time, is like, hey, what about fundraising? Can you guys hear me? Is this on? Yeah. yeah. What about fundraising? What about philanthropy? What about capital campaigns? That's very, very little, like 1% maybe. Because say you're trying to raise um, $10 million well, maybe a foundation will give you 25,000, or maybe an individual donor will give you 1,000 or 5,000. Imagine how much of that it takes to cobble enough together to even build a bathroom, you know? So it's, it's a ton of effort for a teeny, teeny, teeny portion of money. Now, our organizations raise money from foundations and donors, but our projects are financed by the city, county, state, tax credits, and then banks, sort of so. Does anyone add to that or let's move on to the next one? Okay. Gloria, I, I'm just like just tagging on to 
to what Susan said, and I think the question is weirdly ties back to the tech question. Can you you know, why don't you come over here, because I think I can get one of these to go on and okay. um, check. Um, just kind of like where you know where the like the philanthropic money or the donation money would come from because I feel like a lot of people sometimes say to me, why don't we just have some rich folks just give you know cut a check and, and get this done? And you've heard some of the complicated reasons why. And I think one of the challenges we have in the affordable housing sector, which I think has caused some tech folks to kind of shy away, is that foundations and other folks feel like this is such a complicated and expensive and scary sector that they're like, well, we can't, we can't really do anything. We can't even build a bathroom. So why should we invest? And it's been, been like, okay, well, the government will take care of that. And as you've talked about, those sources have really come, come and go. And so I think it's, um, I think what we need to keep encouraging those types of folks to do is to give to the, the advocacy and the policy side of affordable housing. And there are actually several tech-based foundations that gave generously to the campaign for Measure A1 and Measure A in Santa Clara County that helped to um, win these ballot measures that would create more leveraging. So I think maybe that's an intervention for some of those other, you know, big donors, philanthropic places, tech sector places, is to really give to that side of it, but also for all of us to be helping out with the advocacy so that we can have the public financing sources that are really what make this whole thing work. So I just wanted to, to add that. Great. Thank you. I, I would say on the philanthropy side, what we're seeing is the, the, again the, the capital side. It doesn't make it doesn't make as much sense for them to donate money in the capital side for buildings. Um, but where we see some involvement is on the financing side. I would say particularly so there's investment in the credits. We can get that you know at banks and other places too. Um, we're also seeing it around housing trust funds. So. Um, basically, uh, there's a number of localities, there's some regional organizations that are called CDFIs, Community Development Finance Institutions. So those are actually, it's a, it's a very specific designation um, through Treasury, but basically there are, there are non-profit, in most cases, intermediate lenders who will provide funds for development. Sometimes it's pre-development, we get to pay back. Um, sometimes it's you know not actually at a lower cost, but they'll take more risk. But that that is a place in which um, we see some of the foundations play. The, and sometimes what they're doing now is we're we're trying to work with them to develop funds by which we can go. And you know we've heard mention of the acquisition side. Um, you know some of us are working with these foundations to develop funds to go out and work with other types of conventional financing. Um, to bring down our cost of funds so that we can go out and acquire buildings and do preservation. Um, when Susan mentioned that we're competing with, uh, with market rate folks, it's, it's one way that helps us compete is by having um, uh, lower cost markets in available. Okay, I'm going to have one last question and then we're going to move on to the next section. Does anyone have the last question here? Okay, Christine. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so you probably dipped into this a little bit already, but um, two questions, please, um, if you will. Um, the difference between uh, tax credit and low income housing and um, something from uh, the Commission on Disability, not on their behalf, uh, for the city of Berkeley, um, we're working on a universal design for people with disabilities and how easy or difficult is that and is that an issue? I'll just jump on the first one, I think. Um, so um, the, the tax credit, we've been talking a lot about it. It's a, it's a way of funding affordable housing. So it's kind of a subset of the larger universe of, quote, affordable housing, which is really, I probably would define it as, as housing that's, you know, essentially set aside or regulated for people that are at a certain income level that are maybe... Uh, you know, below 50% or 60% of eight or 80% of income. So the, the tax credit is probably the key way of funding that housing. But met, there's a lot of housing out there that was funded without the tax credit. The building I talked about was funded without the tax credit. And um, we just, we, we've just talked about it so much because it's really, um, yeah, it's, it's pretty paramount in kind of what we're doing to expand the stock, whether we like it or not, I think. And on universal design, I don't know you guys. I'll take it. We've done a couple buildings using universal design principles, and I think it's 
really doable. I don't think it adds an enormous amount of cost if it's done thoughtfully, and it really ensures that the housing that we build is gonna be accessible and appropriate for people as they age in place, or maybe if they become disabled, they don't have to move. I think it's a huge innovation in um, architecture, sort of the way green building was before it, um, and I think it just needs to get more out there so that architects change the way they think about um, very simple things like, where's this, where is the light switch? Is it low enough so that, is it at the right height for someone in a wheelchair? Or what can you wheel into? And how wide are the doorways that they accommodate? You know, it, so I think it's just sort of a changing mindset, but not something that should be um, cost prohibitive. Excellent. I, I would distinguish it. I mean, new construction and, and rehab yes. um, different. So uh, on the rehab side, it, is, it can be challenging. Um, you know, yeah, because basically you have structural issues that come into play. It's expensive, um, and then also, um, you know, when we widen doorways, when we uh, create larger bathrooms, we reduce other spaces, um, and so it's not always. And, and if these are existing buildings you don't always have residents who want that. Um, so it, it really, it varies, but, but in general, I think all our community is supportive of universal design. Yeah, I, I think you, know, you can see that reflected in the TCAP regulations, not for universal design, but for actually, actual accessible, accessible units. Um, TCAP requires greater accessibility than the federal government, like 10% of newly constructed units. Um, and TCAP is yeah. the tax credit allocation committee. It's the organization that allocates those tax credits we were talking about. Right. California Building Code has also come quite a long way. I mean, the, they've changed the rules so that most publicly financed new construction needs to have accessible units, and at least 5% of the units. So. Yeah, and Alameda County, in our funding applications, we have um, a threshold that you have to meet the minimum. And then if you provide more accessibility, you get more points. So it's actually a way to incentivize developers to come in with a project that has better accessibility than what the minimum requirements are. All right, I want to um, ask you to help me thank our panelists. that came because this was a you know this is the first time that the county has actually hosted an EBHO event so we're excited about having done it but it, it also really spoke to there being a desire to have this kind of a forum um, all right so the next part of our presentation is going to be a very quick presentation on measure